Yes, I know what you're thinking. It looks ridiculous, I know. But it's cold in China right now. There is no heating. So I have to wear this again. Now let me get my headset. Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Christian and this is Lazy Devs and welcome to this review of the newest Pico 8 version. Actually not just of the newest Pico 8 version, but also of the Pico 8 version before that. So today we are going to be discussing 0.3, no wait, 0.2.3 and 0.2.4. Quick warning, I am a bit of a broken man today. I've, uh, I'm have i just recovering from a, like a stomach flu and I've been coughing for three weeks and also I pulled a muscle. So I'm under a lot of pain right now sometimes, but really only if I laugh or say ow. <laughs> ow, ow. Anyway, let's get going. So um, today we are going to be discussing um, yeah, the two versions. Now I, I maybe I have to explain why I haven't discussed 2 point, uh, 0 0.2.3 uh, before when it came out uh, some time ago. Uh, the reason for that is I was actually busy doing other videos and I looked through the features and I, I concluded that they were not mission critical. They were not things that you really needed me to absolutely, you know, drop everything I, I was doing and, and like dig into the features. I felt like these features were kind of like things that we can go back to uh, at a later point. Uh, now, 0.2.4 is a whole different beast. And I'm eager to look into that. But now that we're looking at the newest version, we can also look back at 0.2.3. And another disclaimer, a lot of the features that we're discussing today are going to be really digging into um, the memory side of Pico 8, you know, and, and manipulating memory, peaking and poking and so forth. So if you are not really uh, in the know about those things, I made a special video for you to check the, these things out. The, I will pop up the video here. Um, I would recommend you to check, to dig into memory first before, uh, you know, uh, playing around with those features because I think uh, yeah, these are quite advanced stuff. There's some advanced stuff happening here. Not all of them, but um, some of them. And of course, there's always going to be down a doobly-doo. There's going to be a list of all of the features so we can skip or jump to the features that you are most interested in. So 0.2.3. So the most important feature, the feature I was actually most excited about, was so obvious that I probably don't really need me to show it off. But uh, just in case, here we go. So if you write some code, let's just say something like... Zero so if you write some code, you can now highlight uh, some code, not just like line, one line, but also multiple lines. And what it does at the bottom there here, it shows you how many tokens this code is. Uh, and you can also click down here uh, to change it into characters as well. Not quite as useful, but still something you can easily do now, for example, is write you know two versions of the same uh, uh, function. And then you can just like highlight the function and you see immediately uh, have a you know, one to one comparison if the new version is better than the old version. Really useful. Another new feature is in Splore. Um, so there is now a, a lucky draw feature. So one feature was removed. I think the collab um, list was removed from, from Splore, but now we have a lucky draw. And this will, um, well, I'm not sure it will work. Oh, it will work. Um, it, this will pick random games from uh, the Picoverse and will show you just random games. They're not completely random. They're kind of weighted a little bit, so you don't getting like, just like absolute filler. Um, but uh, yeah, like here, Dusk Child, like, come on. Like this is not an accident that Dusk Child is just like in our random list of games. Um, but it is a very, very useful feature to just like sample some games from uh, from the Picoverse and to kind of like explore games that you might have not have found otherwise. Another feature is you can export as a new type of format. So now you can go export my game dot ROM ROM. Um, what does that do? Uh, I don't know. Um, so the way I understand it is, you know, each Pico 8 game is 32 kilobyte. And um, those, uh, when you export it as a PNG file, those 32 kilobyte get written into the PNG file. Um, but um, uh, Zap really wanted to have like a format where you actually get the raw 32 kilobyte, not the PNG file, but you know, just like the, the data that is written in the PNG file. Um, so it, this is now a new format called ROM. And it's just, you know, if the card is full, it's 32 kilobyte. Um, 
We don't really have any specific use for it yet, but um, I mean, if Zep included it, maybe there's some master plan, maybe there's gonna be some big reveal at some point. And a uh, really neat feature, there's a new folder function. Um, so there was a folder function before that does this, like if you uh, type in a folder, you get the folder that Pico8 is installed in, that's really nice. Uh, but now you have like additional folders. So you can go folder, uh, for example, config. And then it brings up the folder where the config file is. Or you can go folder uh, BBS. And that brings up the folder where all the files that you download from the from Splore are saved. So this is really nice. Um, or you can go folder uh, desktop. That just shows you your desktop. Uh, or you can go folder uh, backups. And this is actually really useful because a lot of people are maybe you know losing game files, and then it's a very easy way to direct them to ah you have to go there, and these are these is where your backups are. So I like this a lot. And another feature that I want to also to discuss here: there's a new manual. Um, so before there was a manual, but it was just like a text file, which is it's still there. You can still uh, do the text file manual, but now there's also an HTML manual, which is not that fancy and it doesn't it sounds amazing like wow html but it's just like you know it's very basic has some basic formatting uh but it's still you know just black and white text very simple fonts no no crazy stuff um but um because of the extra formatting it's a bit more readable i think there's some some really neat type of text highlighting here uh but yeah if you really want to have the old uh, version wait that must that's a, that's a change log yeah there we go there is a text version you can also just do the text version uh, like in the old times okay so let's discuss some of the api changes um there is mm, there's some there's some some of the things are so a bit like okay um so there is this function called ord so there's char and there's ord these are kind of like the both the um the opposite so to speak so you have a number each character on a screen in a string has a number associated with it uh, for example 102 is let's let's do a cls here 102 is f right and uh char uh, the function char um uh, prints the character associated with a number uh, ord is exactly the opposite so if you have a character you can look up what number that character is ord um, so, for example, if we have uh, the character P, like Pumpernickel, uh, it's 112. So, if we have 112, that's going to be a P. Um, right, so just to establish what is happening. Um, and so, there is some changes to those functions, some additions, which are kind of nice. Uh, the first change is that ORD let me look this up real quick because I have to figure this out. So, okay, ORD, you can put a bigger string in ORG. So you can see, like, you can actually write down pump, pump, pern, kill. I, I hope that's that's how you, I hope I did, haven't written anything dirty in here right now. I'm not sure if this is how it's spelled. Um, so uh, you can now um, specify a position on the bigger string that you want to sample. So yeah, yeah, if we want to have P, then one is, we'll sample one, right? Oh, we have to print this. There we go. If you want P, uh, we type in one, but if you want to sample U, uh, then, then we type in two, and then we want to sample M, it's going to be three and so forth. So we can kind of like um, sample individual characters in a bigger string. Not the greatest thing right now, but um, something, another thing that you can also do is uh, sample multiple characters from a string. And that's actually interesting. So if you add another number to this, for example, three, let's start at one and say three. And if you run this, That's odd. That's because what it does now it is is it outputs three values, and that's kind of like one of those things that Lua does. You know, you can assign multiple values in one line, and functions can actually return multiple values. So, you, for example, you can have like x, y, z equals one, two, three. Right. This is something that you can do. So then x gets assigned to one. Y gets assigned to two and Z gets assigned to three. Very simple, uh, very simple 
uh, way of assigning multiple values to multiple variables in one statement. Well, something you can do now is in, instead of these three values, you can also put in the ORD and sample multiple characters from a string, convert those uh, characters into numbers and pump them into multiple variables in one statement. So now you can go print X, print uh, Y, print Z. Ta-da! <sighs> Why would you do this? Uh, so <clears throat> it, it might be a good idea to kind of uh, encode a lot of information in a string and then uh, and basically read it out from the string and pump it into a, a bunch of variables in, in one simple statement. This might be a useful tool for um, um, uh, tweet cards. I can imagine it, this being quite useful maybe for tweet cards. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, if you have really good ideas on how to use this, do let me know. I'm just letting you know that this exists. Now, there are actually more additions to this, but for this, actually, we have to kind of like skip ahead a little bit because I, I decided to group them in together a little bit because these are functions that I'm talking about now are going to be actually from 2.4, 0.2.4. So this is actually not 0.2.3, but 0.2.4, but you know, it's, it's in the most recent version anyway. So not only do you have ORD expanded this way, but now you can also have char sure. expanded this way. So if you write something like this, uh, it will actually, I don't really sure. What, I think it should be uh, converted into one string. Yes, it was. Okay, 14 is not really a string. Let me convert to something like this. Okay, pause. Okay. Um, so we basically, we can uh, pump infinite number of values into the char uh, function and it will take those values and it will turn them into characters and assemble a big string out of the different values that we pumped into the character uh, function. Again, seems more useful at this point to me for tweet cards maybe, but mm, uh, I don't know. Again, if you have any good ideas of what to do with this, do let me know. And again, another function that is from 0.2.4, but still kind of like fits into this uh, um, this uh, new changes of the API is sub, the sub function, which is again, string manipulation, uh, but in a different way, this uh, sub was like reading up a, a sub string from a bigger string. So if you have a sub pumpernickel, and then let's say two, three, Then we got the um. What we're doing is we're starting at position two and we are uh, proceeding up to position three. So we're getting the um. If we want to uh, get like, what, what is a, what, let, let's say Nick. Uh, we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oops, there we go. Nick. Ta -da! So another thing you can do now is like if previously if you left out the third argument, you would just get the remaining string from that on, like seven and you know the rest of the string. But now there is a distinction. Ooh, you can go comma and nil. So there is a third argument, but the third argument is nil. Weird distinction, but if you do that, it will just sample one single character. Oh. So that might be, um, sometimes this might be easier if you want to just sample individual characters from a um, string. It might be easier to do that instead of just calculating, uh, you know, the starting and end position. If you just want to sample one character anyway, just come on nil. That's actually quite useful. That's actually something that I might use in my programs uh, myself. Not sure why, and I hope I will remember that this is possible. Let's talk about a more substantial change that is actually quite fundamental to how things work. Booleans now can be turned into uh, numbers. So toNum is a function that you might be familiar with. This changes something to a number. So 22, uh, toNum22 will get turned into a number. 22. Uh, but if you go 22a, 
that will be turned into no number. That's not a number, 22a. Now we can turn now true and false into a number. True is one and false is, that's right, zero. I think this is fine, this is good. This, this is definitely something that I will uh, get to use in my stuff for sure. Let's get to one last feature that to me is like a hidden highlight. Like uh, I, I kind of like skipped over this. I was like scrolling through this, like, I don't know what that means, you know, continue. But now that I understand it, whoo, that's big. So you can now, I, mm, numbers, they're big. They are sometimes in our variables and our variables are so small and the numbers get so big. Is what, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's a limit to how big numbers can get in Pico 8. That's 32,000 something, right? And once the numbers get bigger than 32,000 something, then it loops around and it's a whole, whole, whole big problem. Big issue if you are having a situation where you, for example, have to ha save a score. Score are typical things that get like, you know, multiple thousands and you quickly overflow your, your variable and you get into, into, into hot waters. Um, this is because the variables in Pico 8, well, they're actually quite big. They are 32 bit. Um, so they would be technically possible to save a much larger number in, in, in a variable in Pico 8. But the problem is that um, the variables are designed to store non-integer values. So they basically do a little trick there. They divide uh, the number in the variable with a certain number and that give, allows them to express numbers that are comma values, fixed comma values basically, um, but also that limits the maximum number that a variable can, can have. Well, now you can go back to this bigger number, uh, and, but also sacrifice um, the ability to uh, express numbers, uh, you know, fractional numbers, numbers behind the comma. Let me just show you. So I can do print to string, uh, then let's say, let's say, let's say six, and then zero x two. The zero x two is the new part. And now we get a ridiculously high number. So this number is, uh, yeah, that's 393,216. 393, that's, that's not a number that would be possible to express previously in a variable and yet somehow we kind of save that number in, in a, we can save that number in a variable, like six is that number basically, right? So for example, we have score and this score can be six and that's our our huge friggin' score. And then, you know, if we print the score, we can, we can have like a huge number. Now there's obviously a problem here is because like, obviously if we add one to that score and we print it, that score doesn't get increased. Oh, yeah, don't. No, yeah, that's right. That score didn't increase just by one, and it increased like by you know six sixty thousand. So, hmm, how do we do that? Well, there is a trick for that as well. Uh, you basically say uh, like this. This is like a magical thing that you have to write. Basically, we're bit shifting variables around. Let's not get into bit shifting at this point. It's complicated as it is. Anyway, then that allows you to increase things by one or decrease things by one. Or if you want to add 10, then you go, you know, you take 10. Or if you want to say, say it's, um, you know, when add five, then it's going to be five and bit shift it by 60. So again, this allows you to save much, much larger numbers in uh, a Pico 8 variable. What is actually the biggest number that we can save? Millions, billions. Well, again, for high score stuff, this is this is exactly what we're looking for. What is zero? Oh, it's just zero. Okay, good. This is a big deal, and I probably will use it right away in the project I'm working on right now. Moving on to zero point two point four. Now, with zero point two point four, I I have to give a, like a special shout out to this part here, the um, the little illustration. Uh, Zep always makes like a little animated GIF uh, or like illustration to promote the new version. And this time, oh man, 
Look at that thing. That looks amazing. That looks incredible. And I really appreciate it if, uh, when the little illustrations actually showcase some of the new features. And this is like a, such a good showcase of the new features. It already teases at the new possibilities. Ah, oh, mm, good stuff. So you see already, if you look at this, I mean, there's some nice procedural stuff going going on here. But also like look at the, the water stuff. The, how is how is that possible? And also look at the fireflies here. These are also interesting. Mm, we're gonna look at how those are made in a second. If you're interested in like teasing these illustrations apart, you can actually check out uh, Zep posted uh, the demo card uh, as, as like on the actual Lexa Loffel explore. So you can you can just look for the Pico 8 2.4 demo card uh, and you can download the code here and if just by clicking on here and you can figure out how how um, Zep made all those little features. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna step you through some of the capabilities here as well, don't worry. So off the bat, huge, huge, huge bombshell. We now have twice the amount of RAM. <laughs> so yeah, previously uh, Pico 8 had 32 kilobyte RAM, but now we have twice as much. Uh, and this is, Mm, this is confusing. So let me show you what I mean by just launching Memsplor. So yeah, this is little thing that I developed some time ago. Again, this is, uh, has been introduced in the video about understanding memory. If you don't know what that is, if you don't know what you're looking at here right now, then I think you should watch this video first before we start digging into this because this gets, this is very advanced stuff. This is, this, but also, yeah, so exciting. Okay, so in this little program, I had like this little map, which shows you kind of like the entire map of Pico 8, the memory map of Pico 8. And as I said, these are 32 kilobytes. These, all these blocks together are 32 kilobytes. What you have to imagine now is that we have now twice as many blocks. We have these blocks that you see on the screen right now, just like twice. Now, just like a second set of these blocks. This is amazing, incredible, just like, Okay, so how do we address this new memory? Well, um, when we poke something, right? When we poke a value, like we're gonna poke and then we're gonna do like my address, you know, like 32 and then we're gonna poke uh, 10 in that address, right? Uh, the address of the destination, or I guess it would be 0x32 or whatever. Uh, the address um, that we're poking into, that is a variable in Pico 8. And variables in Pico 8 uh, just go up to a certain number, as I said previously. So that number is actually 32,767. So if we run this, and then if we add one more, then the nut variable turns negative. Well, we basically can have now negative uh, addresses. So 32,768, is now a valid address. Previously it was invalid, now it's valid. Now you can write into 32,768. That's the same thing as writing into address minus 32,768. It's, it's just like the entire negative space that was previously just not assigned um, uh, to any, like it wasn't an address, addressable memory. Now it's addressable memory. And it doesn't really matter. You can go negative or you can go higher than uh, 32,767. doesn't matter. In either way, you will get new memory. And the amount of memory is just like twice as much. Another 32,000, uh, but now the negative 32,000. So you might be thinking like, wow, okay, like if you look at the memory, um, there's lots happening here, right? Like in, in Pico 8, like the, you, we have the sprite shit in here, we have maps. Uh, we have like sound effects, we have general, you know, we have, we have screen, you know, we have a bunch of stuff happening in the regular memories uh, in that we had before. What is happening in the new memory that we have now? Well, that new memory is just free for you to use to whatever you want to use. It's general use. We had that before. There's like a little strip in, in the middle here that used to be general use. It was eaten up a little bit by the custom font at some point, like this little part here, this, the little sand colored here, that's now the custom font. Uh, the brown thing is still the general use RAM, but you guess you can see it's not a lot. It's not a lot of space for general use. Well, now you basically have like this whole screen full of general use RAM. You can use it to whatever you want to use it for. What? What, like hmm, that's a lot of RAM 
and what are we going to use it for? Uh, and that's actually was one of the one of my supporters um, on Discord actually Ted asked this question like what can we do with the new 64 kilobyte RAM? We are going to talk about some features um, that this new update has that we can use the new RAM for. Uh, we can use it for map features. Um, but uh, besides that, like very obvious use that I think that will be most interesting in, at the beginning here, unless you know somebody discovers some really cool, cool, uh, cool tricks for it, is just to use it as a buffer for like saving screen data. I think that would be really interesting because as you can see, we have like a lot of screen data. Like a big part of this memory here is just the screen data, what you can see on the screen. And whenever we had like a situation where we had like save things on from the screen to somewhere else, there wasn't a lot of lot of places to put it into, right? You had, you had to like basically put it into the sprite sheet and then recover the sprite sheet somehow. It was a mess. Uh, like there is not enough brown space, the general use RAM. There's not enough general use RAM to save a whole screen. That wasn't possible before. Well, now it's possible. Now you can just save a screenshot basically in memory. And then you can maybe manipulate the screenshot or bring it back at some later point. Uh, there is a lot of options now. There's there you can actually now save multiple screenshots on in memory. I bet it will be like four. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, you can now um, save screenshots and then maybe paste them at a later point. You can do like and like a racing game. You can do like a photo finish. And then later on, show the photo finish, for example, something you can do. It's it's good to have. I'm happy that we're here. And I'm happy to see what the community will do with this new awesome powers. Speaking of awesome powers, my favorite feature of this new upgrade is the ability to define where in the map, where in the memory, the screen is and define where in the memory the sprite sheet is which is super weird and also so very useful. So we have to poke into a very specific address uh, and let me look, let me jump to this address, 5F54. Uh, so we have a sprite sheet address and a screen address. And yeah, as you can see, uh, by default it's 96 and 00, zero or in hexadecimal 00, zero and 60. This basically tells us, or tells PQ8, where uh, the sprite sheet is. The sprite sheet is, begins at zero usually, and where the screen space is, this gray area here, begins here at 6000, right? Now, you can move them around. Now you can say like, oh, actually, I don't want to so show this part of the, of the uh, memory. I want to show a different part of the memory on the screen. Sadly, Zep put a little bit of a handbrake there. Like it, it we can't like redefine them uh, freely. We can basically just swap them around. So um, if you look at this again, so we can have the sp um, sprite sheet space on uh, as as the screen space, and we can have the screen screen space as the sprite sheet space. We can have both of them as the screen space. You can have both of them as the sprite sheet space. You can just there's just like four possibilities there for permutations that we can have here. So the valid values for uh, for these bits here for um, 54 and 55, that's a screen address and a sprite sheet address are just basically 00 or 60. This is very theoretical. So let me show you a practical example because this is something that it's very easy to get like really like what what, what is happening? Okay, let's just let's assume we are back to like this default. Let this is like a default uh, open project that we have no nothing in the sprite sheet, nothing whatsoever. Let's just draw some things on the screen. Okay, something like this, you know, we're drawing a text and we're drawing a, a circle, right? And these uh, draw statements are being obviously drawn into uh, the space, the memory space where our screen is. That seems like a very obvious thing to do. That's what, what they do. They change the screen. They change the memory that is associated with the screen. What we can do now is change which memory, uh, which memory area these functions will affect. So now let's change something about this. So let's do like a poke um, 0x5f54. No wait, 55. Five. That's the 
memory address associated that defines where um, the screen is. And uh, we this usually is set to 0x60, 60, 60, but now we can change it to 0. Let's run this. It's kind of the same, but so some things are different, right? So, oh, hmm. Mm. do you see that little cross over there, right? You see, you see that little cross in the upper left corner, right? That, that, we haven't drawn that. Where does that come from? Well, this is this little cross. This is the sprite sheet, right? We can actually draw more on a sprite sheet here right now. Just like just an example, we draw more in a sprite sheet. Run this, and it will appear here. So basically, with just this little, this little statement here, allows us to just like display the sprite sheet onto the screen. We basically said like uh, the things that are on the screen are no longer taken from the space where that was usually associated with the screen. Now it's taken from the space that is associated with the sprite map. So and this is not just like the things that you see. It's also that all the manipulations, so all the printing and circ fill and all of the print statements and so forth are being applied now to the memory space that is associated with the sprite sheet. So basically we can paint around in a sprite sheet and we can not only just look at the sprite sheet. I mean, that's obviously already kind of like interesting. Oh, you can, you don't have to draw from the sprite sheet on the screen. You can just like set the screen to the sprite sheet, uh, but you can also manipulate the sprite sheet now. So for example, uh, we uh, after we did all this stuff, we can set this back to 0 0.60. And you can see now all of our drawn stuff has disappeared because we have performed these statements, these kind of like draw operations, we have performed them on the space that is associated with the sprite sheet. And so now if we do like an sprite, uh, let's go like a two. Let's put it like in 4040. You can see this is the part of the text that we've drawn on the sprite sheet. This is part of the hello, right? We can actually do this uh, a bit more clearer if we put this at the Y coordinate. This is the H. This is the L. So you can now, for example, write text into the sprite sheet. So this is just like one use. For me personally, a lot more interesting is um, changing where the sprite sheet is, right? Um, because something you can do now is you can say that when you're drawing sprites, you can say where the sprites come from. You previously, the sprites were obviously coming from the sprite sheet, but now you can draw sprites from the screen on to the screen. Okay, so here is more and more advanced example. So this is, I have some, uh, a little bit of a uh, cheat sheet here because I always forget about the different addresses, but it's like a very simple example. This is just like a huge screenshot from my chan suite buns, just like an example, just to, so we have um, some screen data to work with. I pasted this in into the sprite sheet. Uh, and we're just drawing the sprite sheet onto the screen. So we have something on the screen, right? Now, what I want to do now, like we just can imagine like this is the stand in for your game, right? Like just imagine afterwards, you know, you take over and, and do your, your things, right? What we can do now is we can take whatever is on the screen, whatever is on the screen, and we can use this as the sprite sheet and draw from the screen back onto the screen, okay? So let me show you how to do this. We're gonna poke 0 0.0x5f5, oh, 0.5f54, there we go. And we're gonna poke in here 0x60. This is the address of the screen. So now we're setting the 54 is the sprite sheet, and we're setting the sprite sheet to the screen. In fact, I want to make sure that we're not messing things up. We are at the beginning of the draw function. I want to reset this to zero. So uh, we are resetting things properly here. Just a little fix here. Right, so we are setting things now. We're drawing th from the screen back onto the screen. How does this look like? Well, we can do like an SPR statement and let's just do like, uh, I don't know, 60 uh, and draw it into 64, 64. Let's just draw it in the center of the screen. 
there is a there is a there is a tile. Let, let me just draw a tile zero in there. See how, how, how there's, there's there's a little tile. Okay, let me let me make this a bit bigger. Yeah, you can see it now, right? See how the box appeared now twice. We basically took the box from the top left of the uh, corner of the screen and, and and just duplicated it. We basically moved the pixels that are in the top left of the screen and just pasted them somewhere else. Now to make sure that this is this is not because we also have like the box in the sprite sheet, right? Uh, to make sure that you know that this is taken from the actual screen, um, I'm gonna do some. Um, I'm gonna do a line. Right, there's a red line now, right on the on the screen, and we taken we we taken the pixels of, of the box which copied the red line to a different place on our screen, right? So you can have a, like a procedural generated amazing thing, and you can then change things around, move things around, scale them even because again you can even use this with SSPR. This opens a lot. This is like something I really like to do. So I'm going to show you some cool things that you can do with this. So for example, in this case, there's a very cheap and very, very cool way of doing just like a little glitch effect. Uh, copy and paste this here. So I basically do it um, five times or six times, I guess. Uh, I just do a, like, a, I just take a random draw. Uh, uh, draw a bunch of random lines from the screen back onto the screen. And if you run this, you can see like there's like a, it looks like a VCR rewinding, right? And of course you can tweak this around. Uh, in this case, like the um, uh, it's I'm using the whole line, uh, and the line thickness is kind of like randomized. But you can do a much you know much thicker lines, like something like 32. Uh, wait, what did I do? Uh, I think I also wait. Oh yeah, I think I, I need to, yeah. Now it gets really, really wild, right? Let's make this just like a couple of lines per screen. Yeah. Woo! Uh, it's, you can also use like a nice little, you can use this maybe as a dissolve effect. So for example, if we uh, do not replace the screen, we just draw it once on the screen and that's it. Uh, like this, we made a mistake here. <laughs> it kind of dissolves into this same line over and over again. It basically like reshuffles the the uh, the pixel on the screen, and then eventually one line wins over. Ah, that's funny. Yes, yeah, so we can make like really fun transition effects, like Final Fantasy style, like you know weird transition effects. It's it's oh the. There's so much you can experiment with this right now. Let me show you a little trick that I really, really like. Okay, so here's a little bit of a simple code. Uh, there's there's not much happening here. I'm just uh, setting a, um, a transparency palette to zero. Um, I have the sprite sheet of my Chan Sweet Buns in here. Um, I um, These are the default values for the sprite sheet address and the screen address. And I'm just doing drawing a sprite. I'm just drawing a sprite on the screen where the mouse is. Stat 32 and stat 33 are the coordinates of the mouse. And as you can see, this is my chance face. And you can draw them on the screen. Hey, okay, this is not exciting right now. There's nothing, nothing, there's not, not no special things happening yet. You might be familiar with this little trick that if you don't clear the screen every frame uh, and you do this kind of thing, then, then you uh, get like. Uh, a sprite leaving this, these kind of trails. That's kind of like really nice. It's it's fun thing. But now, now things are about to get funky. So first of all, what I want to do is I want to um, set the uh, sprite sheet address. I want to set this to uh, the screen space. So we're drawing from the screen back onto the screen. And now. I'm gonna do an SSPR. I'm gonna start at top left coordinate, zero, zero. Uh, it's gonna be 128 uh, pixels in width and height. And I'm gonna render it to, let's say, minus five, minus five. And I'm gonna scale it up, uh, 128 plus 10, 128 plus 10. 
like so. Woo! <laughs> yeah, a very old trick, a very, very fun thing to do. So basically, uh, every frame we're taking whatever's on the screen and we're making it larger. We're zooming it in, basically. And then we're drawing the, you know, the sprite of my chan on top of that. And this uh, creates like this really, really, really trippy effect. This like old uh, VCR uh, video effect thing. If you move the hair around, ah, this is this gets really trippy. Also, it gets really trippy when you move it away really quickly. <laughs> I'm having way too much fun with this. Yeah. So as you can see, the, there's a lot of really cool tricks you can experiment, especially if when you start resizing things. If you take things from the screen. Uh, draw this on the L's and but then also resize it and, and modify it somehow. There's a lot of potential here. Okay, let me take you through one more example. I think just to, to show you the power of this this feature here again, drawing things from the screen back onto the screen. So again, we have like some information on the screen here, whatever. Uh, this time I'm um, I'm reading the mouse. Uh, do, do I'm yeah? No, wait. Am I reading the mouse? Yeah, I'm reading the mouse set 33 and putting into this variable called LNE. Uh, and I'm just drawing, you know, the entire sprite sheet onto the screen every frame. Um, now to show you what I mean with I'm, uh, I have a mouse, uh, I'm going to draw this on the screen, I'm going to draw a line on the screen, uh, something like this. Something like this. Uh, I'm drawing a red line on the screen to show you I can control uh, this line with a mouse. And now I, what I want to do is I want to recreate a little effect in a little gift that Zap did where you basically have like a, a water surface that reflects everything above the water surface, right? I want to like walk you through the steps of doing this. So there's multiple ways of doing this. Obviously, we could just do like a big SSPR. We're just going to do some maths and we're going to take everything above the red line and flip it vertically and, and draw it underneath the line. But that would be a little bit boring. And the reason why it's boring is that uh, we wouldn't be able to like distort it. We want to maybe distort it. So we want we will do it the hard way. We are just going to do it line by line, right? So we're going to do for um, let's just call it y equals zero to 128 minus l and e. L and e is the variable that saves uh, the vertical position of uh, our red line at this point. Do end. So we're just going to do an SSPR here. 0, comma L N E minus Y. So again, we're going going from zero to some value. Uh, so we're starting at zero, uh, and um, we're gonna start at the red line, and we're gonna subtract that value, that Y value, which again starts at zero and just gets bigger over time. Um, so we're gonna go minus Y, comma 128 comma one. This samples um, the line, a line, and a line that, that goes, uh, yeah, that goes up. It goes up starting from the red line, and uh, we're going to sample the screen going up. Uh, and now we are going to draw it back onto the screen. First, we're going to do it like a very simple mirroring. So we're going to go zero, comma, y, y, right? No, wait, y plus l and e. There we go. Um, and then we're not going to do any scaling. That should be enough for now. So you can see there is a mirror happening now. Uh, when we once we run out of screen, you can see like kind of like the the screen that was there before shining through. So let me change this a little bit. Uh, we're gonna do like an if um, l n e minus y uh, is greater than zero, then we're gonna do this else uh, we are just gonna do a normal line something like this so we're just like drawing white basically we're drawing a white line whenever we uh, whenever if we were supposed to sample 
a line from the screen that is off screen, we just draw a white line instead. Very, very simple uh, thing here. Okay, so this is cool. What can we do now? Well, I think a very important thing to remember now, which I think is very crucial, is that palette statements work on this as well. So we can actually change the pixels that we are drawing. This is, this is, this is big. Look, we can do like, I prepared like a palette here, a big palette statement here that changes some, shuffles the car, the, the, the colors around a little bit. And just, we just don't draw it. And you can see now the reflected water is kind of like darker, right? I'm gonna remove this red line that we had previously. That was the red line. Uh, so now you can just see the reflection. So this is this is big, right? Like you could really have a, a, a water surface that has like like adds a tint to the reflection. This is this is you can do a lot here. But of course, this is like a very it looks very mechanical, the reflection. So maybe we can uh, change things around a little bit. So for example, um, we can wiggle the lines around a little bit, right? So let's see how that works. Uh, let us just, when we are writing the lines back in, let's just add like a sign somewhere in here. Where can we add a sign? Uh, let's go like here, plus sign time. Okay, now we're moving the entire thing, but of course we don't, don't want to move the entire thing. Uh, first, we need want to maybe do the sign to move a bit a bit stronger. Yeah, that seems good. Uh, let me uh, save this in its own variable so it's easier to parse for us. So we're gonna go local sign equals um, like this. Well, let's just let's just save this as s s oops s sign time times five. Okay, this is good, but uh, we want to obviously uh, change individual lines. So let us go like plus uh, I, can we do this? Oh, well, that's wrong, plus uh, Y. That doesn't work, obviously, because these are integer values. So let's go like this. Yeah. Okay. And if you fumble around with it, I, I did some more experiments in here and, and, and tweak things around here. You can get some to something like this, you know, where we're basically like wobbling the entire thing. And then we're also adding some perspective. We're scaling individual lines as we're going down the screen. And we you know we changed the, the color palette. And, you know, this is not, this is just like something that I, I whipped up in a couple of seconds. Uh, obviously, in, into, in, if you invest more time, if you, you could, for example, add the waves as they're going recede further to the horizon the waves should get smaller and so forth there's a lot of tweaking that you can do here but as you can see this is really a nice effect uh, that you can produce fairly quickly none of the effects that we see here were technically impossible before but now they are way more accessible i will post the code to these experiments down in doobly-doo if you want to check it out and and uh, analyze them a little bit but just some more examples so this is basically like um, a bunch of particles on the screen right i'm just drawing particles and we can have the, we have the same mirror code happening that we just had before and you can see that this obviously works also if the content of the screen is procedurally generated before we drew like uh, the entire uh, sprite sheet onto the screen and that's not as exciting but now you can see that this also works if the content on the screen is procedurally gen generated if it's you know if it's just unique you can still take it from the screen and draw it back onto the screen and you can also tweak the colors we're doing so rescale things you can do a lot of really cool stuff here let us talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. Let us talk about, hmm. So there's two things that we can do now. First, we can now have uh, maps of different width. Let me, let me paint your picture. Let's say you are a person who wants to make a shmup, a vertically scrolling shmup. Why am I mentioning this? For no good reason, just let's just imagine you are a person once made a vertical shmup. 
if you look at the map, I'm, I've loaded up a little thing here, but if you look at the map that Pico 8 gives us, um, there is not a lot of space here for do a vertical schmap. Basically like this, this red rectangle here, this is one screen of space. This is one screen of space. I'm gonna run this. You can see this is the entire screen, just the red rectangle. So this is the entire screen. And you can see this green screen, that's basically the second screen. And then we're basically finished. That's all we have, because then you see this, this part here, this is shared by the sprite sheet, right? This is this stuff here that we have see here, just like mirrored here in the, in the uh, map editor. So we're basically can draw two screens if you want to uh, make a vertically scrolling shmup. That's not a lot of screens. Now there is a lot more estate, real estate here. There's more screens that we can have in the map, but it's just arranged in a very inconvenient fashion. It's just like off to the side, not arranged vertically. If we take a column, the tallest column we can have without impinging on the, on the sprite sheet, is just two screens. 256 characters, uh, 256 pixels. One thing you can do now is you can change the map width. So this is here, this um, this address here, 0x5f57. Uh, you can write a number into this, this address and that number defines how wide in, uh, in sprites, how wide in sprites the uh, map will be. That sounds great. So 128 is default. Let's set it to 16 and let's run this. Oh, hmm. Yeah. So there's a, hmm, it's, it's, hmm. See, if we, I made a thing here where I can actually change it live and you can see what's happening, right? If you change the width of the map, everything in the map gets kind of like squished and rearranged together and gets like reshuffled. Uh, kind of like like yeah like like if you shuffle a deck of cards. So if you change this a little bit, you can see, already see like the stair pattern developing. And the more you go, the more they get squished together, uh, and it basically, basically map becomes completely unrecognizable. This uh, this uh, address here is not observed by the map editor. So whatever beautiful map you draw in a map editor, it will get completely scrambled if you change the map width. This is a bit of an issue and you kind of have to, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not really sure how to deal with this uh, if you want to create a little shmup. Um, I, th I reckon you would have to maybe work with an external uh, uh, map editor, or you would have to create your own map editor that would allow you to edit this kind of like change map. Maybe we're gonna see an um, update in the future that will allow us to change the map width in the editor as well. I think this would be very, very useful. But if you go you know, through the, if you jump through hoops, and if you create your map in a scrambled way in the first place, like if it's already kind of scrambled here in the code editor in a way, in a very special way that when you change the map width, in the game that it will get descrambled in a way that, that that looks fine, right? If you go through the steps, um, if you develop your tools for that, or if you use like an external editor that does that for you, then how many screens can you get? Well, uh, you can see this is like me scrolling left and right. This is just drawing, uh, you know, the map once on the screen. Just to, just to, just so we know, right? This is just we just drawing the map once on the screen. There's no multiple map drawing. This is just a single map statement on the screen. That's all we have. That's the entire draw statement, right? How many screens are we getting in a shmup kind of situation? Well, still one map statement. Sixteen. We're getting sixteen uh, screens of map real estate. Basically, we're taking the entire map here that we see here, the entire map, all of the screens. We arrange them into like a very long vertical strip. That's very useful. Again, if you're doing a shmup, uh, but it kind of like comes with a cost. However, this is not all that. Uh, is new in this video version about the maps because here is now the clincher. Something you can also do now is this here, 5F57. 
56. This address, you can write into this address where in memory the map is. Like we've done previously with the screen and like we've done previously with the sprite sheet where we changed where um, the Pico 8 was sampling stuff from, where it was writing to the screen, where Pico 8 was sampling from, where it was writing from the sprite sheet, we defined which um, mm, memory space, which memory address that was, we can do the same thing now with the map. We can, we can tell Pico 8 where the map is. And the cool thing about that is that we can tell Pico 8 that the map is in the new additional 32 kilobyte that we just got. So we got an incredible amount of map space, just like a mind-blowing amount of map space. We can use all the new 32 kilobyte that we just got. We can use it all for map space. Whoa! So again, the same, the same setup as before. I have a huge strip of map. I'm gonna scroll. Let's see how long I will scroll. I have to scroll faster. Still going. There we go, 128, 128 screens of map space. That's a lot of map space. This is incredible. This is, this is luxurious. This is amazing. This is, this is more than enough for a shmup. There is again, a snake in this paradise. There is a caveat here as well. And that problem is that all this new map space is completely inaccessible to the map editor. Again, it's um, you have maybe 128 screens of map space, but you cannot actually draw manually the, all that stuff. Uh, you cannot like go into map editor and draw all the, this map space. It's, it's not accessible to you. Uh, you can procedurally uh, write some stuff into it. Also, you can get like an external map editor and edit it like in, and compress it maybe to a string and then unpack it, use some kind of unpacking algorithm to write into this huge map. Um, but you don't get more space in your Pico 8 file. You can't have like a huge map saved in your Pico 8 file by default. You have to take care, like it's up to you how to get the data into this huge map. It's the Pico 8 won't help you with that. You have to, you're on your own here. Nonetheless, for like procedural generation, or if you find some kind of like cool uh, compressing algorithm, you can have a ginormous map. Uh, again, 128 full screens of map real estate. Whoa. These were the big features. I can already tell you these were the big features. Let us move on to some of the smaller features. So one th thing that we can do now is we can have inline one-off characters. So in the previous versions, uh, we got introduced to uh, custom fonts. We had custom fonts. We were also introduced to the P8 ASCII thing where you have like weird combinations of characters which trigger functions. So now we have like a special function that you can trigger that allows you to print a custom, individual custom character on the screen that you define by yourself. So this works like this, you go print, um, and then we go, so it starts with a slash to kind of like the escape, then the uh, the tilt to, that's kind of like, was like one of the special characters, then the dot. The dot is, well, there's two. There's the dot one, the dot version, and there is the uh, colon version. The, both of these are equivalent basically, but they work slightly different. So in the colon version, you are working with basically a hexadecimal string. So for example, here, this is the one from the example from the page. Uh, these are basically hexadecimal strings. Uh, these are uh, always two characters, define a line in the in an eight by eight sprite uh, uh one bit so black and white sprite 
uh, eight time eight by eight and this entire line is basically you know pixel data it's basically a sprite that um, encoded into a hexadecimal string uh, and then the dot version is kind of like the same thing uh, just more compact encoded into uh into like a bit stream so the individual uh, oh man this is mm, uh how to explain it so individual uh, the, the initial characters in the string are um, each character is 8-bit and so basically each character is one line of um, of the, the sprite and you kind of have to know you know how to convert the pixel data into a number and how to convert that number into a, a character so mm, it's it's not easy but let's let's run this so both is, is the cat right and with this version, with the dot version, it's kind of difficult. Because I, I could write something in here, right? But it will just completely scramble the cat. Uh, let's do a CLS so we can see how this works. Yes, there we go. So yeah, the upper cat is now completely scrambled. Uh, I can maybe add some additional, uh, uh, ooh, something like this, right? And then the cat is completely broken now. Uh, beautiful, I broke the cat. Uh, it's a bit easier with this version. So here's like, this is the first line, this is the second line, third line, fourth, and so forth. And um, so this is like a hexadecimal code. So for example, zero, zero is gonna be a, a empty line and FF uh, is gonna be a full line, right? So you can, um, so you can, uh, that's maybe something that you can um, figure out more easily, but of course it's not quite as compact. Um, Drawing characters this way seems uh, insane. Like, I don't think you would just like write code and be like, oh, I'm going to write this character and then blah, blah, out of your brain directly into the code, you know, spit out uh, a byte code that will just draw exactly the character that you want. So this is actually a challenge for you guys out there. I want somebody to make a, a character editor. Like, give me like a small paint program that you can uh, paint a character and it will spit out one of the dot code or this uh, the colon code so i can paste it in my program like this is this is obviously not something that is user friendly this is just like you know a way of us uh, to encode characters in a string more in an efficient manner um, but we need the tools to able to access this function i think this really needs an editor so if you make an editor post it in the comment section so i can post it in a doobly-doo as well or i will make it as a highlighted comment okay so the next part is a bit okay so this is basically again music from my channel sweet buns and you can see that we are drawing a bunch of stats on on the screen this is basically all of this is just drawing stat values there is some more ways uh, these are just stat values right um, and there is just more information that we can glimpse now from uh, whatever is happening at any given time to the sound that is being played so if you run this uh, 46 till 49 are basically which sound effect is on which channel. There are four channels, each channel gets a sound effect, and if there's no sound effect playing on a channel, it's minus one. That's why 49 has minus one. We, the way we did the sound, uh, the music in Matches Sweet Buns, we always have one channel free for the sound effects. That's the, the, the fourth channel. Now, um, how does it work? So I think uh, on uh, the 50 to um, 50 till 53, this is a which note is playing of that initial sound. So you can see how many notes are playing. 54 is which um, which pattern is currently playing in the music. Um, 55 is how many patterns were played since the last play statement. And 56 is, I think, a more precise way of telling, you know, how many notes were played in a, gi a given pattern. I think this kind of like maybe adds all of them together. Ah, don't quote me on that one. I haven't been using these kind of like stats things previously. Uh, they were there before as well under different numbers um, but these are basically new this is a new version of those stats that is more precise apparently zap did some digging into like some system sound stuff um, previously were sync issues so you pull those stats and they and you you know trigger some gameplay based on a certain note playing and the gameplay the gameplay wouldn't trigger exactly when the note was playing 
Uh, so he redid all the stuff and and added those stats in here uh, with kind of like a new uh, back, new backend, new hook hook up into the system stuff that is more precise and more reliable. So if you previously relied on the previous stats that were there um, previously, you can use those new numbers, those new stats now to synchronize audio with the gameplay. Uh, very will be very important for people who want to use any kind of sound game, music game. You want to trigger something with a sound effect. If you want to have, you know, I know things happening in the rhythm of a beat or something. Uh, I think for that kind of stuff, this is very, very useful. Okay, moving on with some little details. So um, PAL, like if you do a, the PAL statement with two numbers, then, you know, the color of one number gets assigned to the other one number. But if you just do the PAL statement with just one number, that resets that, that palette. Because if you had like previously, if you had like this, that would be just, just reset all of the palettes. All of the color palettes would be just reset to the default, but now you can specifically pick which palette you want to reset. So in this case, so you can reset the screen palette, the draw palette, and the secondary screen palette, right? So this is going to be zero, one, and two, I think. Um, by the way, something I also wanted to sh point out, uh, like if you start typing, the cursor disappears. Uh, I think this is this might have been something from no, this is actually two point. Four, yeah, zero to two point four. Like you start typing, the, the mouse cursor disappears. That's kind of nice. Okay, so there's this little nice function I um, I just dug up in the in the change log. Um, there is a way of disabling auto scroll now. So if you uh, print uh, text on a screen and if you don't specify a coordinate, you will see that eventually it reaches the bottom of the screen, and then what it starts doing is it moves the entire screen up and then appends the new line on the bottom. So there is like uh, new tech new. Um, uh, print statements are always going one further down until they reach the bottom of the screen and then they start scrolling the entire screen, right? So something you can do now is you can disable this. So uh, the you do a poke and the poke is into the address 5F36 and if you poke a 0x40 in there, it will disable the auto scroll. So next print statement will go off screen and there is not going to be any scrolling anymore. So this is useful. Um, I think sometimes there were some issues, some performance issues with um, with auto scroll, like it's uh, accidentally got triggered, and that caused a lot of like uh, calculations in the background, and it, and the performance tanked. And uh, now you can disable the auto scroll if you, uh, you run into those issues. Uh, and yeah, this it's kind of nice. I don't know. And we are kind of like in this home stretch now. There's some other details that I want to show. You can export into the P8 PNG format now, because previously you had to save, right? You have to save my game dot PNG. Right, and that would save it into a p8.png. But now you can export uh, my game, my game .p8 .png. Now you can do that too. And why is this significant? Um, because the thing is, when you save it, um, Pico 8 changes kind of like the file name to that PNG version, right? So if you would then save it again, you would be now in this PNG, you would work in this PNG version of the of the game and no longer in a P8 version of the game. Um, by doing an export, you s keep things in the P8 version so you don't get like confusion, like something that would happen to me is I would export it and like save it as a P8.png and then go back to the code and start changing things around and then save that, just like do a control S, um, by instinct and that would save the changes to the png version but not to the p8 version uh, in, while in reality i wanted to make the changes to the p8 version uh, so with the export it's really clear that if i'm you know if i'm saving this as a png i'm exporting it i don't want to continue edit the png version i'm just exporting the current state into the png version but it's continue work in the P8 version. Now, big deal for me is there is also a, now a 64-bit Raspberry build. So again, I did a review recently of this little device here of the dev term. And there is a version of the dev term that is 64-bit, that has a 64-bit operating system and it wasn't running Pico 8 natively and you had to use like some kind of hack and work around. Now there is a 64-bit Raspberry build uh, that runs uh, on uh, the 64-bit Raspberry uh, systems. This includes the um, uh, you know the A6, A06, and A04 cores of the dev term, but also most uh, Raspberry Pi 4 
uh, devices run 64-bit operating systems. And again, you don't have to use any workarounds um, for this anymore. You can just use a native 64-bit build. This is very, very welcome. I'm very happy about this. Um, one thing to note is that if you, um, this also in, applies to games that you export, right? If you, so if you ever created a Raspberry build for your game, it would be good if you re-export it and re-upload it to, um, to itch.io and so forth so people can download the new Raspberry version, the 64-bit Raspberry version. And actually nothing changes here. You don't have to like add a new version of it. It's just like it's included in the actual Raspberry export, right? So if you have like a... Um, um, it creates like an archive and it, that archive has like all the Raspberry Pi stuff in here and it will have the 32-bit version as previously and it additionally it will have also a version for 64-bit systems. There's some text about a security patch. I'm not going to go into this because um, to be honest I'm I'm not, not, a, not a not an expert on this kind of stuff but yeah there is um, there was a security problem that you could use an exploit to run arbitrary code I think on things and that security patch was fixed now so that's good um, but also there is a problem here as a precaution Splore will no longer allow cartridges newer than this post to be listed or to older versions of Pico 8 so yeah if you are using an older version of Pico 8 you won't see any new Splore posts showing up so you have to upgrade your Pico 8 version to see new Pico 8 stuff in uh, in Splore. This actually is not bad, even kind of like, like, like an anti-piracy kind of precaution every now and then to just like force people to upgrade to the newest version. That's, I kind of like this. And finally, there is a little tease for what's coming up. So there is this little thing here called the Doodle Mod. And if you click on this, uh, oh wow, see, mm, all hail Pico 8. I, I, uh, wow, I'm glad there's not too much. Uh, how, so how does it work? Can I can I click here? Uh, somehow I can. Uh, G to okay, cursors to move. Okay, ah, there we go. I'm I can I can move around here. How do I? Uh, let me toggle gravity. Okay, woo wee yeah. So you can walk around here. Ah, oh, perfect. Chris Pratt. Oh my gosh, I love this. This is so good. Hey. Okay, so this is basically like a jump and run that you can draw the level in and, and then you can jump around here and, and, and play and it's, it's, it's really fun. Um, what is this? Uh, this is basically um, a stress test for the upcoming high score API. I hate Mondays, but I love lasagna. That's what Chris Pat would say. Oh man, whoever did this is amazing. I'm gonna do, put a smiley face in here. Oh, this is so good. So this is basically um, this little like little test, like a little tool, like a little MMO, basically like a, a collaborative MMO uh, that um, uh, Zep created to test the API for the upcoming high score system for Pico 8. Uh, Zep has been working very hard on this and, and uh, I've read some of the updates that, that he was posting that, that this is causing some headaches. He wants to make sure that, you know, this is... Um, 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 this this works well, right? Um, and uh, so he created like this little doodle map. He has now a solution. He cre created a little doodle map, uh, this little app here to test, like to just test if the system is working. Uh, this has nothing to do with Pico 8 just yet. Like this is not obviously not made in Pico 8, um, but it uses the same system that will Pico 8 will eventually use to save high scores. And we obviously, I'm, I'm just like, I'm really waiting for this. We're all waiting for this because this is going to be very, very exciting. We're going to talk about it when it's going to be here. Um, but yeah, like uh, finally adding some built-in um, internet capabilities to Pico 8 will be very, very exciting and very cool to explore. Um, so this is good. This means that we are one step further ahead uh, towards uh, the high score stuff in Pico 8. So this is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is 0. 2.3 and 0.2.4 we this has been a very very long video hopefully i can edit this down a little bit um, but yeah, as you can see there is especially with 0.2.4 uh, the ability to especially to draw from the screen and back into the screen is a uh, big D to me this is uh, one of again one of those game changing features i think we hopefully we're going to see a lot more screen manipulation a lot more stuff you know um, 
doing like basically screen shader kind of stuff where you take the screen space and you muddle around. Maybe you're gonna see more warp effects. None of these things that we've shown were necessarily like impossible before, but they're just now so much more accessible. And I hope to see more and exciting experiments with this. Uh, other changes here are not quite as groundbreaking, but still very interesting. I want to see maybe um, more support for this map manipulation. I kind of like this, but it seems at this point a little bit... Hmm. Let's see how that develops. Yeah, no, just like little details, even like the 2.3, uh, this little thing that you can save bigger numbers in a, like basically have bigger numbers uh, in a, in a variables is also like a big deal. That's like, this changes a lot. Do let me know which features you like the most, which features blew your mind. And also if you create like this little editor for the custom characters, uh, post in the comment section and I will make this into a featured comment. This video has been made possible through the generous support of my subscribers on Kofi. The names of those beautiful people you can see here. Thank you so much. In addition, special shoutouts to the Donut Plus crew, including Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Mark Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Makanai, Scott Goldsmith, Bretsky, Emperor Snow, Hnork, and all caps. If you also like to support my work and enjoy some special behind the scenes access, you can do so at coffee.com slash lazydevs. All right, so this was the summary of these uh, the last two versions. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to the next version where it's going to be all about high scores, hopefully. Fingers crossed. All right, guys. See you next time around. Bye-bye.